afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of the City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this, the 24th of April, 2009. Today we welcome the Executive Director of the Port of Portland, who will discuss the port and its role in our state's economy. But first, I have some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask all in the audience, if you haven't already done so, to please silence your cell phones or other devices that may make noise. As always, we offer our appreciation to our Friday Forum corporate sponsors for this quarter, without whose generous financial support these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are Portland General Electric, the law firm of Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, and Northwest Natural. We thank them all for their support. And if your company or firm would like to be a sponsor of our Friday forums or of our nationally recognized, and nationally recognized citizen driven research program, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the club's office. Now City Club is in the midst of our spring membership drive. This is a very important effort as the club is hard at work in making up a $35,000 op uh, operating deficit that we are facing due to the effects of this economy that all of us are confronting. Members, please try to recruit one person at your table who is not a member. And if you're not a member and are with us today, please consider joining. Membership brochures are available at the table at the back of the room. Uh, the club is waiving its $25 registration fee during this spring membership drive, so the cost of regular membership is the, the annual $165 amount. Uh, also, when any member recruits a new member, both the recruiter and the new member will receive a voucher for a Friday Forum luncheon of the future of your choice. And finally, the person who recruits the, uh, the most new members will receive a dinner for two at the new Nell Chentro restaurant opening in downtown Portland later uh, in, the, in the spring next month. Membership forums, again, are available back there. And uh, you can also join on the club's website or by calling the club's office. Now, what do you get in return for being a member of City Club? Well, consider the following City Club programs that are upcoming. Later today, the club will host our monthly Friday Forum Social Hour at the Wine Down on 28th Wine Bar. Tomorrow, the club's new Leaders Council will host a trail walk and discussion of our region's growing trail network led by Metro President David Bragdon, who's here with us today. Welcome, David. And Washington County Commissioner Dick Scouten. On Wednesday, April 29th, the Club Citizen League Book Group will discuss the book Beauty of the City, a biography of famed Portland architect A.E. Doyle with the book's author participating. Books are for sale at the back of the room. City Club is also getting ready for its popular summertime citizen salon and discussion program and is looking for hosts. If any of you would like to open your home to the di dining and discourse, please contact the club office. And next week here at Friday Forum, City Club welcomes panelist Jonathan Nicholas Jay Graves and Mia Burke, who will discuss bicycles and bicycling as a lifestyle choice, an economic force, and urban planning opportunity. In addition, City Club is excited because we're going to have 18 bike makers who will be showcasing their one-of-a-kind handmade bicycles prior to the program. So arrive early to talk with these artisans and see their creations. That's right here at the City Club Friday Forum next week. So when you join City Club, you support an organization that provides all of this kind of programming, as well as our research reports and ballot measure studies, and has been doing so for 93 years. So members, uh, please recruit, and if you're not a member, please consider joining. Now to today's program. These days, with Oregon having one of the highest unemployment rates in the country, it is important for us at City Club to keep probing for insights regarding the realities of and the outlook for our state's economy. And given the importance of trade manufacturing and, and given the importance of the trade manufacturing and transportation sectors in our state's economy, and given the central role of the Port of Portland in those economic sectors, we are fortunate to have with us today as our speaker the executive director of the Port of Portland to give you his perspectives. A native of Astoria, today's speaker attended Willamette University and later the University of Oregon, where he was student body president. In the mid-1970s, he served as a state representative for three years from the Astoria area. 
He went on to direct the former Association for Portland Progress for five years, and then was president of the Oregon Business Council for six. He then was chief of staff to former Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber for seven years before beginning in 2001 to serve in his current position as executive director of the Port of Portland. Now on a personal level, I have two or three things. I've learned that our speaker is often called Sponge Bill by his staff at the port because he has his uncanny ability to absorb information, remember it, and use it just exactly at the right moment. I'm also told that he has a sweater in his office that he wears from time to time in lieu of a sport coat or suit coat and that the staff agrees that when he does he looks very much like Mr. Rogers. Now, however, lest these mild-mannered Sponge Bill and Mr. Rogers images give you the wrong impression, I can also report that when he was 18 years old, remember he was growing up in Astoria, he was a fish buyer on the Columbia River, and that for what I'm told were his, quote, marketing tools, unquote, he carried a case of Four Roses whiskey, $10,000 in cash, and a 45 caliber revolver. So as you contemplate all of that, please welcome to our City Club Friday Forum microphone again, someone who not only is a City Club member, but is a uh, supporter of the organization, is a member of our leadership council, the executive director of the Port of Portland, Bill Wyatt. Nothing like guns, cash, and whiskey for a teenager to start the process. Uh, well, thank you, Jim, very much, and thank you for uh, having me back to uh, the City Club. I enjoy uh, being here, uh, and I think it's a very uh, interesting time. Uh, I hope at least you'll feel the same way for the topic I want to talk about uh, today, and maybe I can provide a little food for thought and provoke some, some questions. I think it's safe to say that it's been a pretty interesting time for the port uh, over the course of the last uh, several months. Uh, we went in 2007 from a record year in every uh, aspect of our business, volume, dollars, passengers, uh, however you wish to measure it, to this year, uh, which has been uh, very challenging. I think like uh, <clears throat> the balance of our economy locally and globally, we've seen, uh, for example, a, a drop in passengers uh, of about 16% on average uh, over last year, and that seems to be settling into uh, a pattern. Air cargo is uh, down by an even uh, larger margin, a lot less uh, internet shopping uh, going on out there. And we have uh, actually five kind of different lines of uh, maritime business, but they're all down, some more uh, than others. And that's had a, a very significant impact uh, on us. So we're in the midst of a cost-cutting process that has uh, involved uh, a reduction in force, uh, modest although significant obviously for those who are affected, furloughs, pay cuts, and uh, a postponement of a very lengthy uh, list of projects. And while this is painful and I think very difficult, something that would be confirmed I know by my port colleagues uh, who are here today, it's important for us because we, uh, we now have a very strong balance sheet and that's vital because 97% of our revenues at the Port of Portland come from business transactions uh, of one sort or another, landing fees, terminal rents, throughput charges, uh, et cetera. And so we have to react immediately to uh, changes in the business climate and I think uh, you and we will be well served as a result. On the brighter side, we are continuing uh, to make substantial investments in the infrastructure uh, that the port provides to our region, to our uh, community. Uh, and by the time the economic uh, recovery uh, rolls around, I, I think it's going to roll around, uh, this infrastructure will really pay dividends for, uh, for all of us. Projects like very significant uh, dock and rail improvements uh, in Rivergate. We're lengthening the north runway uh, at PDX so that it'll be able to handle uh, wide body uh, international uh, aircraft. We're installing a state of the art baggage uh, screening and detection uh, system out at the airport so that we can reopen the ticket lobby and get all of those machines uh, out of plain sight. Uh, your experience will be like it was in the old days, pre-9-11, where you walk up, you get your boarding pass, you hand them your bag, and you turn around and, uh, and head for your gate. 
we are in the final stages of developing a, a comprehensive de-icing collection and treatment system, uh, which is very, very uh, important to us so that we'll be able to treat this material before it is uh, uh, released. And of course, we're building a new uh, long-term uh, parking garage at the airport with a consolidated headquarters, uh, which we'll occupy on the top of that. Uh, the port also has a, uh, an industrial uh, real estate portfolio that is very extensive, and we look forward to the completion of a new innovative FedEx uh, ground facility out at the Troutdale Reynolds uh, Industrial Park. I'll talk a little more about this later because it's central to part of my theme, but uh, that'll bring 900 jobs to, uh, to that part of the county, which is very significant, and I think the Troutdale Reynolds Industrial Park represents uh, got to be uh, the significant majority of the industrial land available to the uh, city of Troutdale. <clears throat> so today, rather than uh, spending the balance of my time talking about the port in greater detail, though, talking about all the big toys is, uh, is always enticing and fun, uh, I want to talk a little more about <clears throat> our city economy, the regional economy, peel the layers back a little bit, and uh, kind of talk about uh, our history uh, here and, and what that means to us as we uh, look to the future because so much of uh, our economic vitality today depends on that historic core, the trade, transportation, and manufacturing industries which continue to be such an important part of our regional economy. Um, I want to explore why I think these industries and thousands of jobs they provide were not only important to the past, but also critically important to our future and to the green economy, which is so much a part of uh, the discussion today. Now, these basic industries and the land they occupy are important to us at the port because they are the very core of what we do. In the Portland region, basic industries are those industries that export, in many cases through facilities like ours, all or nearly all of the production and as a result create uh, new income and wealth in our state. Intel is a great example and I might just take a moment to introduce one of my commissioners, Diana Daggett, who is uh, with us today and uh, is a senior executive with the Intel Corporation. Seventy-five percent of Intel products today are sold outside of the United States Yet the company builds 75% of its products and employs more than half of its workers here in the United States. In 2008, Oregon exported $19.3 billion in products and one in five manufacturing jobs is linked to those exports. Oregon is the fifth highest in export-related manufacturing jobs in the United States. It's one of the reasons why we're suffering, certainly, in this current economic climate, but it is a uh, it is a reality that has been the case in Oregon for uh, some time. Now, this topic is pertinent because uh, our city and region have begun to undertake uh, strategies and, and processes, if you will, uh, to help rise out of this economic uh, downturn. In just a few months, uh, Metro, and I see our Metro executive, David uh, Bragdon, a former port employee uh, in the back, We'll be re-examining the urban growth boundary to determine if we have adequate supplies of land for industrial growth. The Portland Development Commission is working on an economic development strategy, uh, and the city's planning bureau is about to release its river plan. Even the plan for a new bridge over the Columbia River has significant economic implications. Now, as we collectively uh, develop and finalize these strategies, we need to think about and factor in the types of jobs we want here and where we want them to go. Our economic future lies in emphasizing what we've already got and identifying opportunities for the future. While this process has begun, uh, it is important that we acknowledge our economic past, taking from it its strengths and melding them together with a new and emerging economy. So let's take a look back for just a moment. While Portland, since the days of its very first inhabitants, has been a center for trade, it's also been a place where raw materials were turned into value-added goods and shipped to markets in the U.S. and abroad. As Carl Abbott wrote in his report, uh, Portland's Working Rivers, the Heritage and Future of Portland's Industrial Heartland, 
Portland was a place where raw logs were turned into window sashes, doors, architectural features, boxes, crates, and furniture. It was a place where grain and livestock poured in, bound for markets across the country and around the world. It was a city in which Janssen turned Eastern Oregon wool, yes wool, into lightweight bathing suits and Pendleton wove fine shirts and blankets into the fabric of our economy. Portland was a place where small manufacturers produced many of our beloved cast iron building facades, made farm machinery, uh, logging tools, and huge ships, including about a thousand cargo uh, and military combat ships for the Second World War. And at one time, that activity alone employed more than 140,000 people here in Portland. Today, many of these past activities remain and have grown and diversified into even larger multi-product line international enterprises. Companies like ESCO, which was founded in 1914, or Gunderson, which traces its roots back to 1919, uh, 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 Heister, which was started as Willamette Iron Steelworks in 1930, and Precision Cast Parts, a 1953 offshoot of Oregon Chainsaw, still provide thousands of jobs and keep Portland a strong traded sector city. These are industries that should be a part of our civic pride. They are where craftsmanship and business acumen were nurtured and developed. They are, as I hope to point out in more detail, uh, the bedrock of the next stage of Portland's industrial evolution. Today, as much as was the case in the past, our ability to produce something that someone else wants to buy is a key source of regional prosperity and should be a part of any strategy to grow jobs in the future. Even in today's information age, the manufacture and movement of goods we can touch, feel, or consume remains a driving force and should be a clear element of our economic development strategy for this region for four basic reasons. First. By selling locally uh, produced goods to customers outside the region, basic industries act as economic pumps that bring wealth into the region and fuel uh, future job growth. These companies import supplies, they use road, river, rail, air transportation, and other infrastructure. They provide local jobs often with local suppliers. Their market, uh, they market their products elsewhere, which uh, bring in new dollars to the local and state and regional economy. Real economic impact comes when we create a, a product or service and sell it somewhere else. Otherwise, we're really just taking in each other's laundry. Second, as we've seen with the high-tech industry, basic industries tend to attract businesses along their supply chain. This really refers to a concept often used in ur urban economics to describe the benefits that firms obtain when locating near each other. It is related to the idea of economies of scale and network effects in that the more related firms are <coughs> uh, that are clustered together, the lower the cost of production because firms have competing and multiple suppliers greater specialization and division of labor, and also greater market opportunities. Even when multiple firms in the same sector <clears throat> uh, of that cluster uh, uh, come together with their competitors, there may be advantages because that cluster attracts more suppliers and customers than a single firm could alone. And I think we have a very good living example of this in the country today. When you listen carefully to all the concern about whether General Motors will go bankrupt or, or Chrysler, the concern is less about those companies than this enormous supply chain and the impact that will have on healthy car companies, both the domestic and foreign, same concept. A skilled labor force grows and moves among and between these firms and it in itself attracts new firms uh, hungry for talented and experienced workers. Cities can exploit the economies of this clustering concept and this has been a concept which our region and our state have pursued or attempted to pursue for some time. I think a great uh, local example of this, of course, is the uh, footwear and apparel cluster represented by, primarily by Nike, but also by Columbia Sportswear and now so many uh, others. Uh, as a result of the fact that Nike is here and Columbia Sportswear uh, is here, 
uh, a cluster has developed around them which supports this very unique global uh, business model. Companies like Adidas uh, North America, Keen, Danner Boot, Icebreaker, and many, many others. And it isn't a coincidence that one of China's largest footwear and apparel manufacturer, Li Ning, has its only North American office here in Portland. And today they sell nothing in the United States. Tomorrow, who knows? I think third, uh, basic industries have a huge economic uh, impact on the region. Trade, transportation, and utilities are Portland's largest employers at about 20%. Combined with manufacturing, these industries account for 33% of Portland's employment base. When you add in education and healthcare services, that number jumps to 45%. Manufacturing was the highest, highest growth sector of the Portland metro economy from 2003 to 2005 and played a major role in pulling this region out of the 2001 recession. There are about 180,000 uh, manufacturing and industrial jobs in the Portland metropolitan area. They have an average wage of 59,000, a little over $59,000 a year, which is about uh, just under $15,000 a year higher than the average wage in the metropolitan area. And I think you, many of you may know that Oregon and our region have been losing ground uh, uh, gradually on this uh, income question, and these manufacturing jobs are vital to regaining that territory. Finally, uh, fourth, many of our basic industries offer few training barriers to employment and often provide living wage jobs and a career path for workers without a college education. Uh, responsible planning includes all segments of our population, not just white collar or the creative class. Uh, and it's important to consider this because 68% of the Portland metro region residents don't have either an associate's or a bachelor's degree. 15% don't have a high school diploma. Uh, just as we must develop strategies to keep our college graduates here by ensuring that they can access quality jobs within their fields, we must also think about those uh, who, for whatever reason, have not been able to attain a higher education in addition to seeing that all of those barriers are reduced as well. So let's look at some of the new economic uh, opportunities. And I know the City Club is spending uh, some time and some energy to look at the green evolution or, or revolution and what it may mean for us. Uh, to me, I, I really think this is one of the great opportunities uh, for the future of our region. Portland and Oregon have created, I think, a significant national and international buzz uh, about its role in the green economy, and we are receiving recognition. I would tell you that we're not alone. Uh, I think most other major communities uh, in, the, in the country are attempting to do the same thing. I listened with interest this morning to an interview on NPR with the governor of Michigan, of all states, uh, who sees a revolution in the manufacture of wind turbines uh, and solar cells in Michigan. Uh, so using, using the infrastructure of the auto industry, which is in such decline. And so we're not occupying this space uh, all by ourselves. Nevertheless, the potential is really huge. Uh, experts estimate that in the renewable energy sector alone, global capital uh, installation costs of solar, wind, Biofuel production and R&D on fuel cells will grow from 77 billion in 2007 to more than 254 billion by 2017. Uh, this is uh, uh, an area that um, uh, the state of Oregon, the city of Portland, the region have made a clear and high priority, and I think as you can see, with good reason. These green opportunities, uh, combined with a strategy that works to nurture and grow our basic industries, is, in my opinion, Portland and Oregon's formula for success. Indeed, I'm convinced that green technologies uh, can only succeed here because of the existing industrial backbone uh, of our region, without which we would have neither the skilled workforce nor the basic infrastructure which these new industries will require. Alone, neither of them will be sufficient to see us uh, successfully through to a, a brighter economic day. Together, they can be a very uh, powerful uh, economic engine. Vacated semiconductor and wafer manufacturing plants 
uh, have become home to new solar companies. I think it can safely be said that, you know, but for uh, Jack Murdoch and Howard Vollum uh, creating uh, Tektronics in their uh, uh, garage, uh, the, the location of Intel here and all that it's meant, we wouldn't be producing or manufacturing solar cells here. It is that existing uh, technology and that uh, long tenure development uh, which has allowed this to happen here of all places, sunny Portland. Uh, <clears throat> the skilled workforce that grew up as a result of all of these existing workforces has easily transferable uh, skills to these new green technologies. Uh, today's green industries then in large part stand on the shoulders of the basic industries which have come before them. I think it's also interesting to note that the line between basic and green industries is really beginning to blur as basic industries begin to adopt, uh, adopt green practices or enter into new green product lines. Many of our basic industries and manufacturing firms have created a strong foundation of expertise in transportation, equipment, and manufacturing, metalworking that can be key components of the new green economy, such as light rail or bullet trains or wind turbine productions or photovoltaic cells. A perfect example of this is Miles Fiberglass and Composites, which used to supply parts to Monaco Coach, hardly an icon of the Green Revolution. Now the company is looking at new markets, including the manufacture of nacelles for wind turbines, parts for wastewater treatment technologies, and mass transit vehicle parts. Portland Wire and Iron Works, in addition to their traditional line of business, is now manufacturing streetcars for use here and abroad. And Schnitzer Steel, of course, is one of the nation's largest recyclers of ferrous metals used in the manufacture of new steel things like towers for wind turbines and so forth. Our economic strategies moving forward must embrace the role of basic industries as we set our sights for this new green future. In a region that prides itself on uh, its ability to plan for growth while maintaining its quality of life, and as we begin to look at the next urban growth boundary expansion, we must surely be able to create an economic strategy for the future that includes both the recruitment of new green businesses and the retention of white and blue collar jobs in basic industry sectors that are already here. Now, while uh, we should leverage uh, Oregon and Portland's investment for innovation and leadership in sustainable industry development and focus our efforts on growing those industries here, this must not be at the expense of existing industries. Retention of these basic industries must be front and center because if we don't mind the store, we may end up losing the diversified economic base that we have fought so hard for so long to create here. So if we can agree uh, that basic industry jobs uh, combined with the new strategies to attract green jobs are important, the ne next big question is where can we grow and retain them? As Metro begins to re-examine our urban growth boundary, it is important that we plan a place for these jobs now. Unless we plan for enough industrial land to attract basic industries and green jobs, they'll simply go elsewhere. While we have much to offer, we are not alone uh, in pursuing these strategies. In previous decades, we at the port took care of our industrial land needs the old-fashioned way. We made it, literally, with a 30-inch pipeline dredge. In Portland's earliest days, Cooch and Guilds Lake were filled. Dredge materials changed the configuration of Swan Island, Ross Island, and portions of Hayden Island, as well as portions of the central east side. PDX is built on fill, as is the thriving industrial complex that is Rivergate. But those days, appropriately, are long past. Land is now a finite resource, and one of the things we must turn our attention to is the conversion and reclamation of brownfield sites uh, and the strategic planning and designation of new industrial land that is already served by existing infrastructure. Brownfield sites represent unrealized potential awaiting vision, leadership, and public-private cooperation. We have to work together to create strategies and incentives that stimulate cleanup and redevelopment of these previously active industrial lands and to removing the uncertainty in the market that hinders development. 
By doing so, we can help reduce the creep of job sprawl while reusing and recycling some of the last few parcels of land uh, for new industrial development within our urban center. And along the way, this will create more quality uh, living wage jobs within the city limits. We have a prime opportunity before us. The cost of doing nothing is immense in terms of jobs, tax revenue, and economic growth. The cost to Oregon's livability is unfathomable because doing nothing will only serve to increase pressure to convert agricultural lands to industrial use, spend unnecessarily on new infrastructure, and threaten Oregon's precious open spaces. Open spaces. As I mentioned earlier, the port purchased a 700-acre parcel, which was the formal, uh, former Reynolds Metals Company aluminum plant site. Acquiring the property was a key milestone toward converting the idle brownfield and superfund site to productive use, making over 350 acres available for new industrial development and job creation. I might add 700 plus acres, 350 for industrial purposes. So the other 350 are being put into mitigation, recreation, uh, and, uh, and other uh, unrelated industrial uh, or unrelated uses, uh, which are very significant. About half of the land, in other words, is not being used for industrial purposes. We worked with the cities of Troutdale, the Fairview, EPA, the DEQ, and certainly uh, our partners at Alcoa, who had purchased Reynolds. Uh, their uh, original plan after acquiring Reynolds and closing that plant was just to string a fence around the borders. This is happening all over the country. We talked to them and, and convinced them that we would happily, uh, I guess happily, acquire this site uh, from them after they'd cleaned it up and convert it to uh, what is now one of the great industrial parks uh, of our region. Our experience, though, in dealing with the process of uh, converting this brownfield was, to say the least, excruciating, painful, and slow. Uh, despite all of the talk uh, from regulators about how important it is to convert these brownfield uh, sites, that talk, uh, in, in more cases than not, uh, has not seen its way to action. And this is going to be vital uh, for Portland in particular because so many of its future uh, opportunities in the harbor and elsewhere are in fact brownfield sites that need to be uh, re, uh, reconditioned. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, if we look at the Troutdale Reynolds Industrial Park and the jobs and tax revenue that will be created, uh, I, I think again it raises the question, where exactly is Portland in this scenario? Uh, when local businesses want to expand or site selectors come to look at the Portland region, there are very, very few industrial parcels within the city limits of Portland that are shovel ready. Portland is losing jobs to the suburbs, these kinds of jobs in particular, simply because there is more developable land already there. At the port, we see ourselves as an economic engine for the region. Uh, for the community and for the state, uh, state of Washington, Idaho uh, as well in many cases, but we feel a special obligation uh, to the city. We live here. Uh, the marine facilities that we now uh, operate used to be the Commission on Public Docks, a city uh, agency, and so we uh, want to do everything we can to see these facilities continue to contribute to the growth uh, of this city and to provide uh, these very important jobs in the urban core. But as we begin to examine expanding the UGB, I hope planners will take a good hard look at what can be accomplished right here within the city uh, adjacent to existing infrastructure. The bottom line is that expanding the UGB will not help Portland expand its industrial base and grow local jobs. Located at the intersection of two major rivers, two highways, and two transcontinental railroads, the Portland-Vancouver region is the 14th largest metropolitan exporting region in the United States. Many of the businesses that are here today are here because of this geographic advantage. It would be a shame to squander a century of transportation investment by regulating away industry from this critical infrastructure. At one of our marine terminals within the city limits, we recently removed and recycled eight giant steel storage bins that had been there since prior to the Second World War. They were outmoded and the scrap value of the metal alone paid for their removal. We did this uh, with the 
uh, cooperation of our neighbor, Schnitzer Steel. This recovered about seven acres for productive use, but seven acres is far from enough. As our growing uh, population in this region wrestles with a dwindling developable land supply and competing uses like housing, recreation, wildlife habitat, retail, or general commercial, we must ensure that land designated for industrial job growth is not pushed to the edges and thereby rendered either too expensive or too inefficient, uh, meaning too far removed from existing infrastructure. Now, I fully recognize that it's difficult to create and hold new industrial land because the pressure to convert it to uh, so-called higher value uh, uses is enormous. And I think all the cities and the surrounding areas can attest to that. The port is unique in its ability to hold land and when the time is right to responsibly uh, develop it that way. And I think you will see in the future the port be more aggressive about acquiring industrial land for this very uh, purpose. Rivergate is a great uh, point here, uh, home to a thriving industrial and distribution center as well as the habitat rich Smith and Bybee Lakes. We can do uh, all of this in one, uh, one space. When Toyota expanded at Terminal 4, the adjacent riverbank uh, was improved uh, to a very significant extent. All of the buildings that Toyota added for the processing of vehicles are LEED uh, certified. This was very important to Toyota as a uh, company, and it has given new life to a terminal that uh, really had virtually exhausted um, its useful uh, role in our community. All of this, uh, I might add, is, uh, is occurring with the cooperation and with the enthusiasm of our private uh, partners. Right now, uh, the port is working with the city to annex uh, West Hayden Island, an 800-acre parcel we have owned since uh, 1994. West Hayden Island is unique because of its size, location within the urban growth boundary, uh, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad and the Union Pacific uh, Railroad's main lines run across the island and connect directly to their uh, east-west uh, main lines. Its proximity to Interstate 5 and of course its location on the Columbia River uh, Navigation Channel. No other parcel of land within our region offers so many important transportation attributes uh, or opportunities for job growth. That being said, uh, West Hayden Island is also a very important natural resource. Our goal is to seek a mix of uses, a plan in which both economic potential and natural resources, habitat and recreation goals are taken into account. Our hope is that we can meet multiple regional needs in the future and provide a place for jobs within the city limits. I'm aware that this will not occur without a few bumps in the road and some controversy, uh, but I think it is a pursuit worthy of the port and worthy of our community. Our projections of demand for commodities and products that will flow from this coast to the Pacific Rim and from the Pacific Rim to the interior U.S. markets shows steady job growth opportunity for our city and region. The only question is whether we will be in a position to capture that growth or whether it goes somewhere else, which in itself will cause uh, the uh, local businesses who depend on those services to incur additional expense, both financial and environmental. Uh, to explore, uh, to exploit these opportunities, we really have to work with policymakers to a, maintain and grow our trade base and basic industry jobs. Companies like Columbia Sports, where Fred Meyer Kroger and Keene, for example, who manage warehousing, distribution, and logistics from this region should be at the top of the list when we look at opportunities for economic growth because logistics is really one of the key uh, values that, uh, that our region, region has exploited over the course of the years. We must plan for international trade uh, a future and make strategic investments in transportation infrastructure like the new I-5 bridge and continuation of the Connect Oregon program which has been so vital in providing non-road related uh, transportation improvements and we need to ensure an adequate supply of industrial land strategically located near major transportation facilities and make uh, brownfield redevelopment a key economic development priority. To be successful, it'll take concerted efforts at all levels of government to reduce the risk, the uncertainty, and the high transaction costs associated with moving these brownfields into productive uses. 
Portland and our region will not be able to benefit from the hundreds of acres of brownfield redevelopment sites in the Willamette River without this effort. So in closing, it's uh, up to each of us, obviously, to embrace the green jobs revolution, but also not to forget the core, the true foundation of our local economy, basic industries, because if we do, the green revolution will quite likely pass us by. Thank you, and I would be very happy now to entertain your questions. First question of our uh, speaker, as always, will be from our Board of Governors host. Our host today is Tom Cox. Tom Cox is the owner of a management consulting firm. He's a, me a member of the City Club since 2003. He's been a member of the club's uh, Friday Forum Committee and Governance Task Force. He became a member of the board last year. Tom? Thank you, Bill, for being here. The port has, of course, a very large impact on its environment. What steps have been taken to reduce or mitigate the impact and what results have been accomplished in environmental protection? Well, this is uh, Earth Week. Wednesday, I guess, was Earth Day, so that's a very uh, appropriate question. And I think it's uh, certainly accurate to say that the port uh, occupies a very large uh, carbon and environmental footprint in our uh, community. You can't uh, operate thousands and thousands of parking spaces and have international runways and shipping channels and marine terminals and not um, expose the community to the effects therein. So back uh, in 2000, actually, the Port uh, Commission adopted a uh, very comprehensive uh, environmental policy aimed at um, uh, all of these uh, impacts. Every decision the port now makes um, is filtered through that policy. What is the impact of this change, this, uh, this development? Uh, and I'll give you just some examples because uh, I think there are many. We are, you know, we're, I would say, mid-stage, for example, in spending about $100 million, all told, to collect and treat the de-icing fluids which are used to de-ice airplanes uh, at PDX. This is particularly important because the, the airfield at the runway is for most of the year actually below the level of the Columbia River and so anything that pools or collects would otherwise just spin off into the Columbia Slough or perhaps uh, the river at some point. And so we'll be collecting it, holding it, treating it, and re-releasing uh, it, a very uh, significant impact. Um, at the airport, those of you who, uh, who enjoy or, or like uh, the parking guidance system, the little red and green uh, lights, uh, it has obvious benefits for people who are parking, but it also reduces uh, our carbon contribution by about two and a half tons a year. Same with um, the pay on foot uh, system, uh, fast pay or whatever our brand name is, a quick pay is our brand name for that. Uh, but uh, what you see seldom now are long lines um, at the pay windows because people can move out much more quickly. Again, about two and a half tons uh, of carbon a year. We spend a tremendous amount of effort reducing um, our energy load. We're in the midst of evaluating the possibility of a really substantial uh, solar application uh, at the airport, which would help us uh, reduce our 50 to 55 megawatt load. We're one of Pacific Corps' uh, larger uh, customers. We've gone through the terminal uh, exhaustively looking for opportunities to, uh, to save energy. We use, you know, we do own a 30-inch pipeline dredge, which is a vital uh, piece of infrastructure all by itself. We use low sulfur uh, diesel fuel, and we are converting most of our marine-related uh, vehicles to operate uh, in a similar fashion. Uh, we've been examining the, the possibilities of moving towards more uh, electric uh, equipment uh, for the uh, service equipment out on the airfield at, uh, at PDX. Whatever we can do uh, to reduce that carbon footprint in particular, um, we will do. And so uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of a, a new thing for us, but it's very, very important. We live here. 
Uh, this is an airport that for three years in a row, uh, for example, has been rated the best airport in the United States, and we think these are the kinds of things that will keep us at the top or pretty close to it. Now is the time when we have questions from the floor. Uh, asking questions in City Club Friday forums is a privilege of City Club membership. So when you ask your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member. Please keep your question to 30 seconds or less, and please have it in in a question mark. We'll uh, end at 1.15. Thank you. Joe Smith, City Club member. First, a heads up. Be ready for a question on, on mass transportation, because it will be coming right after me. The, uh, the North Runway next Friday is going to be closed and will be closed for 12 out of the next 18 months. I've been very impressed with the process that the port has gone through in deciding how to do it, and I think they're doing exactly what has to be done, but it's very difficult, because this is going to mean the capacity of the airport will be reduced by at least half, and during busy times, good weather, delays can be expected of anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes. Do you think there is any significant risk that any of the carriers, particularly the international carriers, might use that as an excuse to reduce or eliminate service? Um, I think the risk is pretty limited, uh, Joe. We've worked very carefully with them. Uh, and if ever there was a time to undertake a project like now, uh, like this, it's now, uh, you know, just to really be certain that uh, we wouldn't be overwhelmed with traffic. We've organized a global economic recession, which has had a tremendous impact <laughs> on the aviation industry as, as well. Uh, and those of you who've flown recently probably know that uh, there are still no empty seats, uh, which really is just an indication that carriers are using their capacity very efficiently, and it means fewer planes. So uh, fortunately, uh, uh, our <clears throat> international flights tend to arrive and depart at relatively good times of the day in terms of uh, air traffic. Uh, and because of their international character, I'm quite confident they will get um, priority, to be blunt. But uh, we've worked very closely with them, and the FAA has been terrific about thinking through the process of operating this airport with one runway. Ray Polani, a City Club member. Uh, Mr. Wyatt, uh, I, it seems to me now that with the global warming <clears throat> and energy crisis that we're facing, it's high time that we should shift our priorities from the road system to the railroad system. Uh, it's essential. As you mentioned before, we have two major railroads, east-west and the main line north-south, I think we are at the crossroads, and uh, I would hope that the uh, Port of Portland will vigorously pursue modernization and improvement of our railroad system. I think it's a, it's a key opportunity in this crisis. What do you feel? Well, Ray, this will come as a big surprise to you, but I agree with everything you just said. Uh, so, you know, freight rail in particular for the port is huge. Uh, our entire marine franchise really depends on uh, the successful operation of freight rail. I think, you know, we're going to spend here in the next three, four years about $40 million in expanding the freight rail network in Rivergate alone. Uh, we're working very closely with both the railroads. Uh, we were a key player in helping to develop the Connect Oregon uh, legislation, which uh, if all goes well, will be uh, reauthorized for its third consecutive session uh, with a lot of rail-related uh, investments that will be uh, made. So we, the, the, the port, and, and arguably our region would look a lot different today uh, than it does without the enormous density and concentration of freight rail resources here. It is extremely important to us. Fred Mathis, and I'm a member. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, recently, uh, east of the mountains, um, up around Lewiston, I saw a lot of grain on the ground, and they can't move it out. So the first question, is there a lot of grain on the ground in the port of Portland? And the second question, if so, do any of the exporters plan to build more facilities? Yeah, 
you know, I, I have to apologize. We can hardly hear anything anyone says up here. Uh, so I didn't really get your question. Go ahead. What happened? I don't, we couldn't hear. You couldn't hear him at all? <clears throat> okay. Uh, I can I, just get a little closer. Did I mumble? I, I don't think so. I get it closer into the Go. mic. The mic is your friend. Okay, Fred Mathis here. And I, I'm a member. And the first uh, statement was that I saw a lot of grain on the ground when I was uh, in the east of the mountains area. And uh, so I want to know, is there a lot of grain on the ground in the port of Portland? And part two, uh, if so, do any of the exporters plan to put up more grain handling and storage facilities? That works well, actually. Uh, so a lot of grain on the ground. Uh, this year is, uh, all told, is a pretty uh, bleak is too strong a word. It's just not a great year for, uh, for wheat exports. Uh, there are a variety of reasons, and, and frankly, not a lot of it has to do with the global economy. A lot of it has to do with things like you know, weather in Australia or Ukraine or uh, who's buying, who's selling. Uh, two years ago, we had uh, record volumes and record prices. Uh, so farmers should have been happy, but of course, they tell you that they weren't able to plant enough, so they couldn't take advantage of it. It's, farmers never get it right. You know, it's either uh, the prices are too low or volume's insufficient. Uh, so I would say it's going to be a slow year, uh, despite your uh, having seen a lot of grain on the ground. Having said that, uh, we uh, are working with our grain tenant, Columbia Grain, owned by a Japanese trading company, Morabeni, to expand their facilities dramatically. And this is directly related to channel deepening because they're now able to consider uh, products that they have heretofore not been able uh, to, uh, to export here, uh, corn, soybeans, and, and other products. And I think uh, kind of exciting news for those of us who, who uh, pay attention and, and work on the river, the Port of Longview is, you know, somewhere along the way of developing the first new uh, grain terminal on the Columbia River in probably 40 years. This will be a multi-hundred million dollar uh, investment and it just gives life to uh, this uh, continuing and important um, export. So we're going to see new storage uh, developed and uh, hopefully the next planting season will be better than the last one. Um, hi, uh, David Roth, uh, member. Uh, Bill, when I came back uh, to Portland in 79, you were already uh, an important figure in public affairs, uh, pushing the envelope, uh, looking towards the future. It's nice to see such longevity. Um, you've, let me speak then to your point. Uh, you've made the point that the future of Oregon's economy depends so much on uh, the investments already made by our historic industries. I'm sure you'd also agree that the same thing can be said about our public infrastructure and the state's investment, uh, community's investment in public infrastructure, including higher education. How concerned then are you that corporate investment in public infrastructure through corporate income taxes has fallen from about 15% of the total a couple of decades ago to around 5% now? Well, I think, uh, first I just want to acknowledge the first point that you made about the public infrastructure because uh, obviously I'm here today talking about roads and bridges and kind of basic uh, old-fashioned big-shouldered stuff and, and that's important to the port. But, uh, you know, having just returned, I might add, from uh, 10 days in, in uh, Asia with a group from the Portland Business Alliance, and I've been to China now many times, I was struck by um, the, the shift that is occurring there, the move up the, the ladder of industrial sophistication. Uh, and a lot of people we were traveling with had never been there before and said, gee, what are we going to do? Uh, and I think the, the answer to that, obviously, is we, we're going to have to compete increasingly with our brains, and we're going to have to compete historically uh, really for the better part of the 20th century, the United States competed by consuming and then selling our leftovers. And uh, that's not going to be uh, successful any longer. 
and I think, uh, therefore, I worry greatly about, uh, particularly in this current climate, the governor, I guess, is going to be here in uh, a couple of weeks, and you'll get a better picture for, from him about the state of the uh, state uh, budget. Uh, but, you know, in a, in a state with a $15 billion general fund and prospects for losing about a third of that, uh, public investment is threatened. And I think that is uh, something for all of us to pay uh, attention to. With specific uh, respect to the corporate uh, income tax, I guess uh, my view is this. It isn't surprising, and I'm not sure that that statistic alone tells the complete picture because Oregon is a small business state, so many businesses actually don't pay the corporate um, income tax. They pay through uh, other uh, venues. Uh, but, you know, capital is now global, uh, and it's very hard to, to pin down. And these companies, very few of whom are domiciled here, pay attention to the climate, the business climate uh, that exists uh, wherever it is that they uh, locate. And so I guess my own concern is to try and find that balance between equitable uh, contribution, but also uh, make certain that uh, in the interests of that equity, we don't also drive people away. The truth is we're an income tax state, um, and income taxes primarily are paid by people you and me. Uh, and at some point here in the not too distant future, we're going to have to come to grips with uh, how much more we're going to be willing to pay in order to keep what we've got and, and improve upon it. Um, that's the, the primary source of, uh, of government, uh, state government uh, funding uh, for these general government activities. Uh, we've decided to limit the property tax. Uh, I don't know that that's going to get revisited. Um, Oregonians have said I think nine times now that they're not terribly interested in the sales tax, uh, there really aren't a lot of options. And uh, just for the record, I'm not sure that we're able to smoke, drink, or gamble our way to prosperity either. Uh, although I think it's worth an effort, you know. Uh, you know so. Thank you. Virginia Cornyn, City Club member. You mentioned a number of times the importance of cleaning up brownfields for the local infrastructure and local land availability. Has the port or with alone or with any of your partners looked into creating a job creation program possibly supported by stimulus dollars to get that work started now? Well, I'll tell you, we are involved in so many uh, cleanup and or brownfield uh, related developments. I'd love to get started now, the biggest being the lower Willamette. I started at the port in 2001, and uh, the general thinking at that time was that the Superfund site in the lower Willamette would have a record of decision. I think it was 2005 or six or something like that. The current estimate is 2011. My personal opinion is probably closer to 2014 or 15. Uh, in the meantime, those of us who signed up for the voluntary administrative order on consent have spent $60 million. Not one centimeter of material has actually been removed or cleaned with that uh, resource. So we'd love to get started, but we need the green flag uh, from our friends in the regulatory agencies to get going because it is so important. We can't actually begin the cleanup until there is a, an agreement about how, where, and, and when to, uh, to do it. Having said that, and I really want to acknowledge the Portland Development Commission and the city for creating a, they call it a harbor ready uh, process to address many of the cleanup sites in the Portland Harbor, the land side, uh, sites uh, for exactly this purpose, and it is going to take a huge undertaking, a huge effort to do that, but there are a few hundred acres there that would be prime uh, industrial um, opportunities, and uh, the cleanup itself will be a job generator, and I'd love to be able to start putting people to work doing that right now. I'm Gina Harden, I'm a City Club member. I'd like you to take this minute we have left and comment a little bit more about the development on West Hayden Island. Um, 
what, where will the access be for shipping things in there for to use that development and will the port be how much will be uh, recreational for public and how will that facility develop Well, I, at first I want to recognize over here Ann Squire, who is chairing uh, the uh, city's uh, committee. It's a very diverse and broad-based uh, committee. I'm sure she would agree with that. Uh, every possible interest is represented. Uh, and their function really is to assess uh, this annexation uh, and ultimately to make recommendations to the Port Commission and to the uh, City Council about the future of West Hayden Island. So uh, in terms of our industrial interest, um, it would be, if you're familiar with West Hayden Island, the, the railroad bridge is essentially the line of demarcation between the eastern part of the island, where most of the development is today, and the western part of the island. Most of the industrial development would want to be fairly close to that. That's the widest uh, spot of the island, and it's also close to uh, the main line of the two railroads, which would be important. My own view is that we will have to provide a separate um, a truck and, and auto bridge to the island uh, and it would be west of the railroad bridge so that the industrial traffic, whatever it may end up being, isn't going through the center of East Hayden Island from the um, interstate uh, freeway because who knows, I mean, uh, that, that could be substantial and it would really affect, I think, the quality of life for residents who are already on uh, the river. But these are issues that will certainly be addressed by, uh, by this uh, committee. Uh, the interesting point about recreation is that if you live on uh, Hayden Island today and you don't happen to own a boat or a slip, you really don't have any public access to the water. And uh, our view is that uh, West Hayden Island is a terrific opportunity to create that kind of access, not just for island residents, but certainly for island residents, but also for the broader uh, community as well. And finally, uh, the, the island uh, represents significant habitat opportunities. It is not a pristine um, piece of real estate. It's been used and abused over the many years. It was identified, it's, it's, it's noted in the journals of Lewis and Clark, but it looked a lot different then than it does today. There are many invasive species uh, and some really significant problems that, that will need attention. Uh, and we think the combination of these uses, the mix of these uses, will each support one another. And we have a history in Portland, I think, of being able to do this uh, successfully. We've run out of time and need to stop there. Uh, please remember to join us next week for our Friday Forum on uh, Portland's handmade bicycle industry and the role of bicycles in our community. Uh, please remember the new rule is you can't leave your table until you've identified who is going to be the new City Club member from your table. Uh, membership forms are uh, uh, available back there. And finally, please help me express our appreciation to today's speaker, the Executive Director of the Port of Portland, Bill Wyatt. We're adjourned. Thank you.